Hello and welcome to Long COVID Foundation podcast. This is the channel where we discuss the most relevant information on Long COVID. For those who missed our interview on gut health with Dr. Leo Gallant, I would encourage to watch our previous session from start to finish as it will help you to learn more. If you're new to the channel, do not forget to subscribe. I can then help you to get answers relevant to your symptoms. Thank you very much. And let's jump to our Q&A session on gut health. I would like to go to part two of our interview. And this would be questions from our community members who suffer with long COVID and are at different stages of recovery. I should say the majority of people still have lingering symptoms for more than a year. So Dr. Gallant would really love to share your expertise among those who suffer. And I had a great pleasure to share information that we will hold uh, this interview with you on gut health. And I had huge flow of questions straight after. So I know we have a time constraint, so I will cover the most common ones because I think you've covered all these aspects in your presentation. Most common are how to keep the trade-off between eating fermented foods that are good for the gut, but maybe histaminic. So I think you've partially covered, if you have anything to add on to, to this question? Well, if there definitely is a histamine intolerance, there are supplements that can help because of their ability to control histamine and mast cells. Quercetin is probably at the top of the list. Um, PEA, palmito oil, ethanolamine can be helpful. they are peptides. Um, one called BPC-157 has been, has been very helpful. And, and some people actually do benefit from taking drugs, um, antihistaminic drugs. Uh, in fact, there was a study that was done um, in which people with long COVID were put on um, an antihistamine, regular antihistamine, the kind you use for allergy, and famotidine, which is an H2 antihistamine, the kind that's used for heartburn. Uh, and they took them for a month. And after a month, there were significant changes in the function of T lymphocytes and associated with an improvement in symptoms like fatigue. So, uh, so that's a, those, are, those are all possibilities for dealing with the histamine mast cell issues. I see. Thank you so much. And uh, another question is, uh, is a lot of acromancy a good thing or not? Um, Acromancy is a very interesting organism um, uh, and possibly a keystone species. There, no one has really demonstrated any acromancia disturbances or issues in COVID-19. Acromancia um, seems to be protective in certain conditions, um, but there have been some concerns about it in others. Uh, for example, in multiple sclerosis, there's concern that acromancia is too immune stimulating and may actually aggravate MS. So, so um, when I try to understand whether I want to boost or inhibit acromancia, um, Parkinson's is another condition in, in which higher levels of acromancia have been associated with a worse prognosis. Uh, so I, I really base it on the individual. Uh, how do you reduce the sulfovibrio? Yeah. The sulfovibrio is a, is a type of bacteria that metabolizes sulfur. Now, sulfur is present in foods, especially in protein. Um, there are many supplements that people take um, and some personal care products, but there are supplements that contain sources of sulfur. Uh, N-acetylcysteine or NAC and glutathione are sulfur um, con containing substances. There are bacteria that reduce sulfur. They add hydrogen to it. That's the process of reduction and create a gas called hydrogen sulfide, which has a, smells like rotten eggs. In fact, the smell of rotten eggs is due to hydrogen sulfide. Now, like acromancia, Hydrogen sulfide is a very complex substance because there is evidence that at a certain level, hydrogen sulfide is protective. 
It may be anti-inflammatory. Um, it's actually good for neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's when it gets to the brain, but it can at higher levels increase inflammation, slow motility in the gut, and maybe even increase cancer risk. So it's about getting the balance right. Now, there are a number of substances that inhibit the ability of organisms like desulfovibrio to produce hydrogen sulfide. Uh, peppermint is the most palatable of those and the most commonly available. So peppermint capsules, peppermint tea, strongly brewed for 10 minutes. Another one is oregano. Um, and which is pretty widely used as a supplement. Cooking it, uh, oregano may destroy its um, antibacterial activity. But, uh, but those are the two things that are at the top of my list. And then I, I, have a, I have a protocol for that with other specialized teas. If anyone wants to write to me, I can send it to you. Thank you so um, much. Thank you. Uh, on... Following low histamine diet, um, people who suffer with uh, gut-related uh, issues for, for a while uh, after COVID, they do lose weight quite a lot and there is an issue gaining it back. So most foods make gut issues worse. So any advice for this particular case would be really grateful. Okay, well... Um, the first is there are a number of low histamine foods that need to be eaten. I mean, you need enough calories if you're going to try and gain weight. Decreasing inflammation. So sometimes people lose weight because of the high level of inflammation and the interference with absorption. So if someone has multiple food intolerances and cannot gain weight, uh, I recommend examining the gut microbiome as it appears through stool tests, checking small intestinal permeability and absorption. Um, those would be the first steps because maybe there's something in addition that needs to be done. Uh, see, you don't really cure histamine intolerance with a diet. You just control the symptoms of it. But in order to cure histamine intolerance, you really need good nutrition. So yeah, you can be caught in a real bind. Um, if you have difficulty finding the right sources of nutrition. And I would also look at adrenal function in that situation uh, because the adrenals play an important role in suppressing inflammation when they function normally. Mm -hmm. I see. And what do you think of FMT? It stands for fecal microbiota transplants. Uh, um, yeah, I've, I've uh, recommended FMTs to many patients over the years. There's I haven't seen any data on FMT in the context of COVID-19. The donor is not everything, but vitally important. I mean, there are two components to it. There's the prep that you use to try and wipe out or alter the bacteria that are already present. Um, but even more important than the prep is the donor. And I think a really carefully selected and screened donor is essential. Now, FMTs pretty much came to a halt with the pandemic, and I don't know if anybody is doing them again. And what type of elimination diet would be most beneficial after COVID? There are many different ones, so it's hard to know which one would help. Right. Well, first of all, you don't necessarily need an allergy elimination diet. Definitely eliminating alcohol and uh, sugar and highly prepared foods. Um, I mean, that, that's the kind of elimination diet I recommend for almost everybody, but the alcohol in particular after COVID because of its impact on, um, on intestinal health. Um, so I, I would start with that, like cut out foods that have artificial ingredients, um, added sugar, added fat, and uh, try to eat as much as you can a whole foods diet with lots of vegetables and um, healthy fruits. Now, if you can't do that because that upsets your stomach or makes you feel ill in some way, 
then you're going to need a personalized evaluation to figure out what is the best dietary approach to follow. Sure. And which fruits and vegetables are okay to buy if they're not organic? So if there is a preference for the ones with thick skin, like oranges, bananas, watermelon, or it doesn't make any difference? If, if you can peel them, then you'll get most of the pesticide residues off them. Great. Thank you very much for this interview. It's amazing that you've shared this knowledge with us, and I'm sure our listeners would appreciate uh, this information and share it uh, among other practitioners because this is our aim. So we want to educate sufferers at the same time, share these resources among practitioners. So thank you very much for this interview. I hope you enjoyed and we'll speak to you later. <laughs> well, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share this information. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you and goodbye. Bye.